Well, listen, can I um, offer a warm welcome to everyone here um, who's made the effort to come and, 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 and um, hear Rico and just be re-enlivened about the joy that it is uh, to share Jesus with those who don't know him personally. Uh, just a couple of things housekeeping-wise. If you need the loo, um, they're just off the corridor behind me. The gents is just around the corner, so keep looking if you're a bloke. Um, there will be opportunities at sort of half time for, for a, a, um, a little bit of a, a stretch of legs and refreshments. So please um, do feel free to get those at the hatch um, at half time. Um, but enough about me. I'm just going to pray and hand over to Rico. Rico, thank you so much for just joining us here and, and giving us your time. We realize uh, it's, a, it's family time as well um, that you've given us, um, and we all find that precious. So thank you so much. Let me just pray for you. Father God, um, we worship you because you are the God who creates, you are the God who gives us order, you are the God who has poured out your love on this world and given us that great revelation of who you are and, and how much you love us. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus Christ who has come into this world as one of us to take away our sin and to make us right with you so that we can know you personally. Oh, Father God, we thank you so much for this, um, for this great gospel that, is, that has saved us, for this message um, that uh, teaches us about who you are and what you've done and who we might become. Lord God, may we this evening um, just be thrilled once more um, to be reminded of this great message, but to be reminded of the wonderful commission that you have given us, uh, that we should be used to share this gospel with this lost world. Lord God, I pray that you would anoint Rico this evening um, to teach us with a, a passion uh, for you and for the gospel message. I pray that you would anoint us to hear this, uh, to embed it in our hearts, and Lord God, may you stir up a fire, a, a, a compassion as well for our friends, uh, for the lost, Lord God, that we might be changed this evening. Father, bless us now, we pray. In your name. Amen. Over to you. Great. I'm on. Well, thank you so much for coming. And can I just say, it's just lovely to be uh, not looking at you on Zoom. So it's just a joy. I mean, I can't tell you that it is absolutely lovely to be here. Um, when it comes to evangelism, just as I begin, can I ask you to listen in a certain way? And what, I, as you listen, I don't want you to listen as a reservoir. So, you know, it's just, you know, okay, what can this fat angler can do for us tonight? It's not, don't listen as a reservoir. Can you please listen as a river? <clears throat> so, can you think of, please, two people now, as we just begin the evening, that you can pass this on to? One Christian and one non-Christian. And as you spend the evening listening, can you listen for them? Because it would be great to do some training of one of them, just to pass it on the Christian, and uh, I don't know why they're not here tonight. You can say uh, at the start, you, we, we were, you were mentioned that you weren't here. Um, uh, uh, but secondly, the non-Christian, someone who God has just put there in your heart. So can we just get those two names? And, and perhaps just turn to the person next to you and say, look, the two people are these. These are the two people I'm listening for tonight because I'm going to be a river for them. Over to you. Just, just those two names. Just do that uh, uh, as we begin. Let's just get these. So we're here to serve them. We're here for them as we go this evening. Who are the two people we're listening for? Great stuff. Okay, so then um, if we can uh, uh, take our bits of paper for this evening that are here, what I want to try and do now is do a little bit of a training talk for you. If you're, if you're here, um, certainly with the Christian there, we're to be, do jot this down, disciple-making disciples of Christ. That's what we're to be, disciple-making disciples of Christ. So all of us are to help make disciples. Now when it comes to evangelism, again, you might want to jot this down, there is the evangelist, 
That's what I am, to prepare God's people for works of service. So I must never run a church. That's what that means. There's the pastor teacher who's to do the work of the evangelist, and we're all to be witnesses. But, 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 but within that, um, uh, as we're all witnesses, as we grow, certainly in the Church of England, we just totally um, neglected evangelism. The best evangelist we ever had was John Wesley, and we threw him out. That was our best one. We kicked him out. So we've all got to be doing it. So uh, as you go back to your fellowship group or that individual you've written down, that Christian, a great question to start is, is this question. Do you see it here? What stops us doing evangelism? Now, <clears throat> just as we get to that question, please jot this down. There are three words that help us to listen. To jot these down. As we listen, we listen with three words. Explore. What are they saying? What are they saying? What are they saying? Explore. Listen, listen, listen. Explain. What's the next thing to say? Because we know Titus 1 verse 1, the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. So I'm listening. What's the next thing from God's word to say to help them get going? And thirdly, encourage. How from your own life, failures and successes, whatever it is, do you put flesh on that? So I'm always listening. Today I met with Jane at lunchtime and then I met with just a couple of individuals on Our Hope Explored. Um, both of them sort of on the edge of stuff. I'm listening. Lord, where are they? What's the next thing to say? How from my own life do I illustrate that? So actually it was interesting with because he said to me, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just leaving uni. I don't know what the point of life is. And I said, gosh, when I was 1982, my godfather was killed in a cliff fall when I was 15. And I remember thinking, what's the point of anything if we're going to die? It was like waking up. I think COVID's done that. You sort of wake up. So I said that to him. That was from my own life going, I'm with you. How can you work out what your career is if you can't work out the big story you're in? Anyway, enough about that. On, on we go. So, okay, so I'm going to explore, explain, encourage. I'm listening away. And, and how do I start anything on evangelism? Well, I found that it's madness to start speaking out about, about evangelism until we hear what people feel about it. So here's my opening question. I always start with it's there. What stops us doing it? So I'll always be saying to people, you know, what stops you? So just personally and, and churches-wise, can you just turn to the person next to you, twos and threes, and just say, what is it that stops us? So just have a couple of minutes on that. If you don't want to say anything, turn to the person next to you and say, I don't like people, I'm not talking to you, and then just do it on your own, okay? <laughs> Off we go, great. Off we go, turn to the person next to you. What stops us doing it? Twos and threes, that'd be great. Okay, everyone. Everyone, that is a, that's a great question to start with. And of course, as we ask that question, with people, we begin by listening. And just to say, with evangelism training, training is not lecturing. Training is interacting and listening. So, so you know, I, once an American guy from Willow Creek said that to me. He said, the trouble in England is you think lecturing is training, and it's not. So we, you know, we go back and forth with stuff. Okay, what stops us? Someone... Um, don't leave me stranded here. Someone put a hand up. What is it, what is it that stops us? Just give us a, a thought. Sir, yeah. Fear of not fitting in. Brilliant. Now, the first thing, jot it down for your notes, everyone. We've got to get fear, fear of not fitting in, fear of rejection out there. And then we've got to say to people, otherwise they won't be doing evangelism. Brother, sister, we've got to say to people, you're going to get rejected if you do this. They murdered Jesus they're going to reject you. So when it comes to evangelism, um, you know, it, it's a wonderful thing. It's a great joy. But I want to start by being honest with you. Otherwise, you'll, you know, you'll think I'm lying. We're going to get rejected. And therefore, this is the next key word to write down for this evening, everybody. It's such a classic word today, but it really is important. Identity. I've got to have my identity in the grace of God. So here's the thing to jot down, brothers and sisters, as you take this away, so that you'll know it, but to take it away to train people. So as John Chapman, the Australian evangelist, taught me, whether you accept or reject me doesn't make me valuable. What makes me valuable is Christ died for me. And I've got to get that into my heart. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. Um, I, 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 I wrote this book, Honest Evangelism, uh, in a sabbatical um, in 2014, I think. It, anyway, it was during the World Cup in Brazil. So, of course, I then didn't watch the World Cup. I didn't write it, because I was meant to, but I was watching the football. 
And then my, my wife and I spent a half term in the October writing this. I got a third at university, but she got an English major. So she wrote it with me. And after five days, I said to her, I said, darling, isn't this lovely? Here we are working for the gospel. And she said to me, I hate you and I hate this book. So there we are. That's, I'd just like to commend it to all of you. There we are. Honest, but I called it honest evangelism. Because we're not honest with the non-Christian about the message. And we're not honest with Christians about the fact that actually we're going to get rejected by some. We're going to, we all know that, and other people will be thrilled. But, it, but there's going to be that isolation, so I've got to get into me. Look, what makes me valuable is the Lord Jesus. So, so do you know what I do to get my identity in place? Um, each morning in my, my Bible in a year, I have some questions I ask myself each morning. Rico, when were you converted? Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. So I wasn't converted in 1982. I was converted before the beginning of time. That's when God wrote my name on his hand. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but I find that overwhelming when I think of my depravity. I find it amazing. Rico, how does God feel about you? Romans 1.17, but now a righteousness from God is revealed. <clears throat> God is delighted with me because he's delighted with Jesus, and I relate to God through Christ's performance, not mine. <sighs> That's amazing. Rico, what sort of day is today going to be? Again, jot down the verse, Romans 8, verse 28. So when were you converted? Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. How does God feel about you? Romans 1, 17. Um, uh, 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 what sort of today is today? Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for our good. And what is our good? That we're predestined, to, that we are uh, conf confirm, conformed into the likeness of Jesus. Now, all things aren't good, but God is somehow working all things out to make me more like Jesus each day. And if he was on, in control, jot this down on Good Friday, he's in control today. So, you, brother, sister, you might be here today and it's absolutely brutal. But I'm saying if he's in control on Good Friday, he's in control today and Sunday's coming. And therefore, here, jot this down as well. This is how I keep myself going. I say to myself in the light of Romans 8.28, Today is a great day, because today is the day God has planned, and if it's good for God, it's good for me. So I was late today because there was a fight, a fight on the station at East Croydon, and that's why I'm late. So I sat there going, Lord, you're sovereign. I don't know when I'm getting there, but I've just got to be godly and sit here. But I mean, the Lord's in control. Um, I don't know who the people are in East Croydon, but anyway, if you're from East Croydon today, welcome. Lovely to have you here. But I'm just saying, <laughs> and then, and then, and then, uh, 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 and then here's another question I ask myself. This is my identity. This is the story I'm in. Why is today a better day than yesterday? Why is today better than yesterday? Because I'm a day's march closer to home. I'm a day's march closer to seeing Jesus. What will it be like? 1 Corinthians uh, 2 verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived uh, uh, what God has prepared for those who love him. So you can't even imagine how good it will be. Think of the best moment in your life. The best moment in your life. Wilkinson's drop goal, I don't know what it would be. The best moment. But think of that moment, multiply it by infinity, and, and you're not even at what it will be like to see Jesus in the new creation. And that's the story I'm in. I've got to get that into my identity. So as I head out, that's, that's what I look in the mirror before I look out the window. I'm internalizing this stuff before I'm going out to speak to people. And, 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 and we'll see what will happen. So, thank you very much. I've got to get that in place. Where's my identity? Because I'm going sometimes to get rejected uh, as I do this. Uh, let's just have a look at, uh, at just uh, what often I say to people in terms of getting evangelism going. Turn to page three. Can we see it just as we look down? This is on how, but it's good to get it in the start of the evening. Here are the four steps that I'm often thinking about. So, you know, in terms of just helping us think forward, the first thing we do is we celebrate people. Do you see that? Uh, so you've got on how, but just that right-hand page, just to do it now. We celebrate them. They're made in God's image. Have we all got that? So, so you've got the front, evangelism, why and how. You go inside. On the left-hand side is 2 Corinthians 4. On the right are these four steps to telling others. Do we see that? On the right hand, on the first page, and you see celebrate, serve, tell, exit. Have we got those four? 
So this is the outline I often, when I'm trying to train people, you know, I've got to get my identity in place, but here are four steps. Number one, celebrate people. So God has sovereignly put them in your life. He, you know, his, 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 the, great, the great purpose of the world is people meet Jesus. Secondly, serve them. Well, what's, what's their biggest stress? You know, but I want to serve them. First thing is, my darling wife went up and said, this, this is when the recycling goes out on Friday morning. Uh, here's a box of chocolates. Welcome. Um, uh, uh, random acts of kindness. Thirdly, tell. So we cross the pain line. We get our identity in place, but we tell. So, so it's time, you know, we've asked lots of, I call them level one questions. Where are you from? You know, what are you doing in London? Tell us about your family. Those are level one. Level two, then, is the question, do you celebrate Easter? That's the one I'm going I'm to be asking on the block. Do you celebrate Easter? Um, you know, just, just have a question you, you'll ask. But number four, interestingly there, is, is exit. So, you know, with the Brits, they just go quiet. You say, do you celebrate Easter? They go quiet. So then you go, gosh, do you think Man United are going to pull it together this season? <clears throat> what do you think is going to happen? Or you go, you know, Farrell's being dropped. How are they going to do? I think it's quite good. We might have a different centre pairing. I don't know. But you just go back to, to, to celebrating them. But those four steps in my outline, I'm going, right, celebrate you. It's great to know you. Secondly, serve you. What, what, what's your biggest stress? You know, what, what, what's going on in your life? Thirdly, a question. Do you celebrate Easter? You know, can, you know what, what do you make of this spiritual stuff? Or how was lockdown for you? But we just get good at asking questions. Okay, here's my question. For the non-Christian you wrote down at the start of the evening, you've just written down their names, you wrote down two. For the non-Christian, what do you think is the question for them on the spiritual front? Is it, you know, what, what would be, what's the question you want to pray you can ask them? And you might want to say, look, I'm a bit nervous about asking this because these sort of questions can put pressure on a friendship and you're very important to me. So you, you tell them they're important for you, but can I ask... What do you make of Easter or, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, what do you, what do you make of, the, of, of, of hope? Do you, do you have any? Do you see what I mean? What's the question? Uh, just, just over to you. What, what, just have a think about what that might be. What might be the, the, the question that you would be having for that, that person? Um, just as you think about it. I mean, you know, it might be, if you believe in God, what sort of God do you believe in? Or do you ever pray? Or... If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Jot those down. Are they any good, those questions? Um, uh, uh, would you like there to be a God? Can you think of anything Jesus said? You know, just say, look, can I ask you a spiritual question? I don't know how you'd feel about it, but um, uh, if Jesus was standing here now, what would you say to him? And, you know, ask, can I ask you a question on the sort of spiritual front, you know, with Easter coming? Do you see what I mean? Just, just what... What's a question you could ask them um, uh, 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 on that front? Just anything that you think, gosh, that would be, you know, that would be one I'd, I'd like to ask. Where are you on your spiritual journey? What, what, what do you think about meaning and purpose, particularly in post-COVID? Um, what, what do you think purpose is? Gosh, I don't mean to be too heavy, but spiritual matters. Do you think about them? Do you see we've got to have some questions ready? Phil, give me a hand on this. What are, what, what, what are questions for this area that are good? Anything there you are. I didn't brief you at all, brother. And now I've put you in the... Your identity's in Christ. If you do this hopelessly, you remember that, you know, that, that's where it is. But any, any thoughts on that, on questions? Um, possibly something COVID-related. How, how have you... How have you, you, have you found COVID? Yeah. Yeah. I think the onion with COVID has been interesting. So the onion normally is... The outside of the onion is just, just you know, what do we do? Job, kids, family, events... The, ins the, the next level of the onion is, is how are you feeling, and the center is worldview. And I think we can get to worldview much more quickly because we're, we're, you know, we're, in, we're in the same storm. We might be in different boats. Okay, everyone, um, what else stops us doing evangelism? We've just got that down. We've just gone through that. By the way, exit's really important there. A lot of people don't do evangelism because they, they think, once I'm in, I, I, I can't stop. But, I mean, if they go quiet, you go quiet. If they say something like, Oh, do you know, I haven't thought about spiritual things since my granny used to take me. Really? Where was that? Oh, we lived in Milton Keynes. Where did you, where did you go? Oh, she used to take me at Christmas, but she was pretty devout. What did you make of that? Oh, I loved her. What, what about, did you get anything at the services? I don't know. Just keep asking questions. Don't forget, Jesus in the Gospels asked over 300. Did you know that? 
he asks over 300 questions in the Gospels. And as a minority, we need to, to be asking them. Brothers, sisters, okay, what else stops us doing evangelism? What else stops us? Yeah, fear of rejection, we've, and that's right. And, and, and it, again, that's when I've got it. We are going to get rejected. We've got to get our identity in Christ. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Too busy. Gosh, that's a great, that's a great thing to say. And, and you know, um, time... Uh, love is a four-letter word, T-I-M-E. So it's, brothers, sisters, here's the issue. We do make time for what's important to us. We do. But I think there are two things I'd say about, about making time. The first is, if we're praying for people, we make time for them. So I tend to have five guys I'm praying for at a time. And, you know, if I'm praying for, I saw today, I'm praying for them. And if I'm praying for them, the next thing I do is get my phone out and get hold. Don't have too many. But if they're, you know, who are the, who, maybe there's one or two people you think are spiritually warm. If we're praying, we'll make time for them. Um, so, so if we are too busy, we need to, you know, if, if we're not doing it. I found in the, in, the, in the book I wrote, by far the most traction, the most feedback I got was chapter three on idolatry, which is what are you living for? So if you've not got time for evangelism, can I ask you, what are your daydreams? What are your nightmares? What are you living for? We've got to go down into those idols. And you might find, do jot this down. This is the thing to, to say on that. Here's the thing to say. I, I don't have faith in God. I seem to have faith in my agenda for God. And so if I've got an agenda for God, I expect God to be a divine waiter and deliver the life I want. And therefore evangelism isn't part of that. I go on Sunday, I tip the waiter, but he's meant to give me the life I want. So, brother, I think it's digging right down into idolatry to work that out. Um, let me tell you something on idols. So when I arrived at All Souls, the church I'm at in central London, um, where John Stott was, he used to get up at 10 to 5 in the morning. He slept for half an hour each afternoon. I adopted one of those two habits myself. But, um, but when I arrived there, I found I kept lying to people. I kept lying to them. So they'd say had you done something? And I'd say, yes, I had when I hadn't run off and try and do it. Why was I lying? I was lying because my idol was to be seen as a fine Christian leader and fine Christian leaders are efficient and I wasn't efficient. So I lied to show I was when I wasn't. That was really, it was desperate, but it took me a long time to work that out, that my, my, my idol was a good thing, but it had become a God thing. And often if we're, if we're, if we're not doing evangelism, and by the way, thanks for coming tonight, some good thing, like the kids or the grandkids or the job, it's a good thing, but it's become a God thing. And we've got to try and dig that out. Thanks. Too busy? What are my daydreams? What are my nightmares? What else have we got? What else stops us doing it? Brother? Yes. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. So, I might, I might be pigeonholed as the Bible basher. What's interesting, brothers and sisters, is this survey. I don't know if you've heard of it. Talking Jesus. Let me do the back of it. www.talkingjesus.org. Um, this was a massive survey that we did, and then we didn't believe it, so we repeated it. Um, because we couldn't, the results were extraordinary. 67% of people in this country have got a Christian friend they like. Why do they like them? Because they're selfless. They serve. So what I'm saying to all of you, brothers, sisters, well done. Keep being Christian. The non-Christians in this survey said, no, I know John. He's a really nice bloke. He looks out for people. He serves them. So we might be thinking that we get put in that box. But if we're serving and loving people, they, they, that, that's not what they're thinking. 67% have got a Christian friend they like. Of that 67%, 20%, this was pre-pandemic, I expect it's high now, want to know more. So one in five of those people that like you wants to know more. That's still a four in five rejection rate, so welcome, even though they like you. So keep loving them, keep asking them, and they're not going to go up and say, I want to know more about Jesus. But if you ask them, one in five will say, yeah, I'd like to do a Hope Explored or a course. That makes sense? So, so that was it. Interestingly, in, in this as well, um, uh, you know, um, Two-thirds of the country have got a Christian friend they like. That's amazing. And they like them because they're selfless. That was a great discovery. Another was, of that 67% of got a, who've got a Christian friend they like, what percentage of them think that Christian friend is homophobic? Answer, 
So we are not seen as homophobic. The, the person on the street who knows us knows that we're not like that. We've all got you know, gay friends that we know that we're kind to. So again, homophobia is something the media says about us, but it's not something that's happening on the ground. So again, can I just give you a word you've got to have here? It's confidence. Confidence in being Christian. It's appreciated. Keep loving your street. But good question. But we just got to be careful about the media depict us as this. But actually, so often it's not actually what the real people are thinking. If we're kind. So keep being kind. Great. What else, um, what else stops us? Sir? Great, 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 great. Yeah, that's right. I don't have the answers to the questions. You know, now, just to say on that, do jot this down. The cults have all the answers. If you're in a cult, they will have every answer. Okay? So what we say is we say, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'll get back to you. So uh, people like the honesty. If you don't know the answer, say, I don't know. That's a good question. Can I get back to you? But, but then go and find out the answer, and that's why we do it in community. But I think the humility of saying, gosh, no, I've not thought about that. That's a good question. I'll, I'll get back to you. So I, I, I just think, you know, it's, it's maintaining that. You don't have to have all the answers. But let me tell you what the answer is normally. It normally is Jesus. Today, we, today we, when we were walking along, he said, I've got, he's a philosophy student. He said, I want to, he said, I, I want to know with Christian faith, you know, what the methodology is, what the big story is. I want to know how I should live. He said, I want to know the question with science. And there was one other I can't remember. I said, look, mate, the answer to all of them is Jesus. Okay, did he rise from the dead or not? That's science. The whole Bible's about Jesus. In terms of how you live, it's not a bunch of rules. Just look at him. He's how we live. And we fall short, and he died on the cross for that. But it's normally Jesus. You know, we just commend him. Um, to, you know, crucial. What else, what else have we got? What else stops us? Okay, let's, let's, let's keep going. But it's a great question to start with, and, and we, we go from there. So what stops us? Now, just to say, we've then got to feel that motivation to keep going. And have a look down here. Do you see these four Gs just before we, we break for, for, for tea and coffee? I, I, I just want to commend to you these four Gs that I find really help me be motivated to tell others. And that's on the front page of it. So can we turn to the front page? Evangelism, why and how? And we're going to start with Romans chapter 1, verses 14 to 25. And just these four motivations, because the last thing I want to do is I want to say, go and do it. I want to say, if this is what we believe, what do we want to do? So I'm always wanting to take people to the gospel. <clears throat> and I've mentioned this verse before, but, 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 but the first thing that mobilizes us for evangelism, can we see as we look down, is grace. And I've said this before. Do you see verse, four, verse 16? <clears throat> Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So what does this mean? Well, let's remember Martin Luther. Do you remember Martin Luther, the story? Do you jot this down? He said, I hated God because God demanded a righteousness from me and all I felt in my heart was wicked. And then in 1505, he had, do jot this down, his tower experience. He was reading Augustine and he suddenly realized, reading Romans 16 and 17, and this created the Reformation, he suddenly realized that at the heart of the gospel was not a righteousness we give to God. The essence of the gospel is a righteousness we receive from God. So for your notes, it's a declaration. Luther said, how can we be simul justus et peccator, at the same time justified and sinners? And the answer is the gospel. So Jesus doesn't just die for me on the cross, which is amazing enough. He gives me his perfect life. And I relate to God through his perfect life. So here is a book, and it's everything I've ever done wrong. Rico Tice, The Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. And I wonder if you can see every page is blank. Because when God sees me, he sees Jesus. 
I am declared righteous. So, jot this down in terms of my identity. I don't live for approval, but from it. I am absolutely loved because God knows me to the bottom and he loves me and he gives me his son's righteousness. Luther told this story, I'll make it modern, but, but imagine 2010, much to the chagrin of Kate Middleton and to the amazement of the nation, one morning Prince William comes out of um, uh, 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 St. James's Palace, he walks out Haymarket, he goes right along Shaftesbury Avenue and he goes left into, into Soho. And he walks into Soho on a Saturday morning and there is a woman there and there are needle marks up and down her arms. Her language is terrible. There's a smell of alcohol. There are clients who have used her and she's there. She's, she's, you know, there's no question that she's a prostitute. And William walks up to her and he takes her by the hand and he says, we're going right now to Westminster Abbey to be married. And he takes her to Westminster Abbey and he marries her and then he says, and now you're coming home with me to live in my palace forever. And Luther says, that's what God has done for us in the gospel. He has justified us and he's adopted us. Now, brothers and sisters, if I can't move you with that, I've got nothing else to say. It's amazing. The reason you won't be moved by that is if you've got an inadequate view of your own sin. So John Stott, every morning in his quiet time, would say we need to grow downwards. He said the job in the quiet time is to see our sin afresh and then be reminded of the gospel afresh. Simeon is the person John Stott got this off, and he was vilely treated in Cambridge as a don. Hated. But actually, he'd come out each morning and be full of joy and love of his fellow man. Why? Because he'd reminded himself of the wonder of the gospel each morning. I mean, the young men loved him in Cambridge. By the time he died, 10% of the clergy in England were Simeonites, had come through Simeon's church, Holy Trinity, in Cambridge. Why? Because they saw the joy in him. So uh, as I grew up, my favorite thing, when Dad got back, um, he'd get back from uh, you know, business trips, and he'd always bring me an asterisk book. And when I got given my asterisk book, it was absolutely my treasure. Honestly, for an hour and a half, I could have read this on a manure heap. I just loved them so much. Is the gospel that for you? Well, it depends how deeply you're seeing your sin. So number one, grace. Have we got grace in place? You know, I'm, I'm, I remember at school, I was taught three things at school. You're not good enough, prove yourself, it's a dangerous world. And the gospel came along, you're not good enough. No, I'm not good enough, but I've, I've been given the righteousness of Christ. Prove yourself, no, I live by his righteousness, not mine. It's a dangerous world, yes, but he will, he will take me through it. Oh, the wonder of it. So number one, grace. Secondly, as we look down, the second thing, can we see, what's the second G here? Gehenna. Gehenna. And Gehenna was the, um, sorry, I'm just getting illustration here, was the stinking uh, uh, rubbish dump outside of Jerusalem. And when Jesus, brothers and sisters, when Jesus wanted to describe what happened to people who died without Christ, he said, without forgiveness, he said, they went to Gehenna, a fire, a place of torment. So there's only one Jesus, and brothers and sisters, he speaks again and again of hell. And therefore, with our neighbors, can we see Romans 1 verse 14, that first line? Paul writes, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach to you also the gospel. So, there are two ways to, 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 to fall into debt. The first is, Phil gives me this £20 note and I've got to give it back to him. But the second is, Phil gives me £20 and he says, Rico, will you pass it on to Sam, my son? And until I've given it to Sam, I'm in Phil's debt and I'm in Sam's debt. And that's the debt we're in. So I am in debt. And Jesus again and again, brothers and sisters, he speaks of hell. I've written the verses down there. Do you see as we look down? I just need to remind myself of, I mean, you know, I need to cauterize my emotions, but this is the most loving man that ever lived. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Then as he was being murdered, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's the most loving man that ever lived, and yet he speaks this Jesus again and again of hell. Why? Because he knows how serious sin is. We live in a culture that laughs at sin. 
But the risen Christ promises us there'll be a day, day of judgment. Acts 17, 31. He has set a day when he'll judge the world with justice by the man he's appointed. He's given proof of this by raising him from the dead. So the resurrection is a great hope, but it's also a great warning and will be raised, and Jesus then speaks again and again of hell. Let me just read it to you. Matthew 5, verse 22. Uh, let me just read you. Uh, Raka, uh, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Matthew 5, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Matthew uh, 7, now this is very interesting, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So John Stott said, the road to destruction, do jot this down, is defined by two things. Tolerance, I can think as I please. Permissiveness, I can do as I please. And fascinatingly here, the next verse is, watch out for false prophets, they come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they have ferocious rules. So how do you know it's a false prophet? They don't teach you about hell. So when I'm listening to a Church of England bishop, are they speaking about hell and, and getting people off the road to destruction? Uh, Jeremiah 23, the mark of the false teacher is they say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So at the heart of the gospel, it's being saved from hell through the cross for heaven. Um, in 2018, I um, uh, was interviewed uh, about GAFCON, which is the uh, uh, Church of England um, uh, breakaway group in, in the Southern Hemisphere. I was at a conference in Jerusalem. And um, in that, I said, uh, any sexual practice outside marriage um, will lead to destruction, whether heterosexual or homosexual. Um, I didn't actually even use the word hell, but that went round. The result is I've been no platformed at, at, at um, Parliament when I was going to speak there. I've been no platformed at the Foreign Office. I've been no platformed at Oxford University. I've been no platformed at Durham University. But I'm not withdrawing my statement because you have to warn people that any sex outside marriage will lead to destruction unless it's repented of. And, you know, but, and I have to have my identity in Christ, but we've got to keep saying it because this is the warning. So, uh, um, you know, one of my mission statement in life, if you said, Rico, what's your mission statement in life? It's this. Uh, you might want to jot it down. It, it's an interesting one, but I, I you know, really believe it. People without Christ go to hell. And we've got to warn them. I'm not withdrawing the statements I've made. I hope the tone was right, but I'm saying it because Jesus died because we need to be saved from hell. So four questions on, around hell. Number one, does hell exist? Answer, that's the question. Yes, Jesus says so. If, if we don't believe Jesus on, on hell, we don't believe, we can't understand what he said on anything else. And I can't speak to you on heaven if I can't speak to you and say, Jesus teaches me on, on hell. People want the hope, but you've got to do the warning. So, does hell exist? Yes, Jesus says so. Second question, what is hell like? Answer, Jesus says it's a place of separation and suffering. It's a place of separation and suffering. I come from a non-Christian family. Can I tell you, when you bury people and, you, and they've died without hope, it's, a, it's, it's desperate. It's desperate. I leave them in God's hands, but I don't have much hope for them. The Lord judges, not me. I never put someone in hell, but I just say, you know, we need the cross to save us. Uh, third question. So question one, does hell exist? Yes, Jesus says so. Second question, what is it like? It's a place of suffering and separation, of darkness, of fire. Thirdly, Thirdly, who goes there? Well, Matthew 5, 29, people who do what they like with their hands. And, and Do you see what I mean? Uh, as we come to Matthew here, Matthew 5, let me read it to you. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. It's better for you to lose one part of your body, the whole body to throw it into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to use one part of your body than have it thrown into hell. In other words, the people who go to hell are the people who say, I do what I like with the hands... God has made. With the feet, God has made. With the eyes, God has made. But it's lovely to talk to you tonight because I'm no platformed in university. I've spent 30 years trying to work out how to give evangelistic talks at university, and now I'm, I'm, I'm no platformed. I'm pursued by Stonewall. Uh, they find out where I'm speaking and then, and then make me the issue, not Jesus, so I have to withdraw. But, 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 but the people who go there are the people who say, I do what I like, and God says, no. 
there's a judgment for that. But I've sent my son to die so that you can be saved uh, 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 from, that, from that judgment. And, and fourth, fourth, how should we escape? Well, Jesus died on the cross. He was forsaken so we need never be. Um, when I was at Oxford University getting my third, um, when I got my third, I said to my tutor, was I close to a 2-2? He said, no, Rico, it's a very solid third. Um, <laughs> so I knew the Church of England was the only career option available, but I, but I, um, I played rugby for the university, and, uh, and uh, I gave a tape of a sermon I'd preached. I was at Wycliffe Hall, John 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I gave this tape um, to one of the guys in the rugby club, a guy called Ed, to, 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 to play it. And one night before a game, he played it to Chris and Dave and Ben. They were all in the same house, and Dave was the captain of the Blues. And as Dave sat and listened to this tape, in which I said, either we pay for our sin ourselves, or the Lamb of God pays. Either we pay in hell, or he pays on the cross. As this tape was playing, Dave got more and more angry. And at the end of it, he said, Rico's not my friend. And they said, don't be ridiculous. You play in the front row together. You play golf together. You room together on tour. He said, no. He said, if that's what Rico believes, the fact that he said nothing to me in, in 18 months means that he doesn't care for me. If he cared for me, if that's what he believes, he'd have told me. So as we think of hell, and we'll have a break now, I don't want to ask you two quest three questions. Do jot this down. Three questions to ask about hell. Number one, do you believe it? Do you believe it? If you don't believe it, then forget it. You know, if you don't believe what Jesus says on hell, then, you know, just let it go. But you've got a great problem with so much of what he writes because he's crystal clear about it. But do you believe it? Secondly, brother, sister, do you love people? Do you love them? And then thirdly, will you warn them? Will you warn them? Will you say, I'm in debt, I need to say something to you? Look, I'm, I'm worried about saying this because... You know, it's, it's pretty countercultural. but if I care for you, I need to pass this on. Let's pray as we, as we uh, close this session. Oh, Father God, we, uh, we're so amazed Jesus came to die for us. Thank you for the people that told us about this. Lord, we think of those we've not warned. We're worried about rejection. We do pray, Lord, that you'd give us courage, uh, perhaps as Easter comes, to say something particularly in COVID in the midst of this, Lord, please help us. Help them to know that we love them. Help us to believe it. Help us to say something sensitively, but to, to ask a question, to, to help them be warned. Amen. Let's break there, and we come back um, 15 minutes' time. Is that right, Phil? Lovely. Great. Right, we've had Grace, and we've had Gehenna. And I'm giving grace to people who are late sitting down and still talking. That's fine. I'm offering you grace. That's lovely. By, by the way, just to say on that one, on, on forgiveness, just if you're, you know, uh, just, there, were, there were three big things, do, perhaps jot this down, that came out of COVID. Fragility. We, we, you know, we flourish and die. So all of us have got people we know who've died. And it's heartbreaking. I must have taken 12, 13 COVID funerals. Um, we lost three people in a week at All Souls at one point. So, so fragility, fragility. We, we, people now are death salient. Uh, the second thing that's happened is relationally, uh, it's brutal. And so that's the next, the next thing. And that's where um, grace is so important. And Colossians 3 verse 13, bear with each other, forgive whatever grievances you have, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So in any Christian home, in any Christian marriage, by the way, as I say this, can all the marrieds keep their elbows in, please? I don't want to see the elbows flying out. Elbows in if you're married and you're with your partners here. But there are two phrases that are key. Number one, I'm sorry I was wrong. And number two, that's okay, I forgive you. And marriages end because people won't say sorry. Oh, that couple there, how are you doing? Which one is it there? I can see that. See me afterwards. I'll, we'll have a chat. But, but I'm sorry I was wrong. And that's why it's great having a mask. No one can see who we are. But I'm sorry I was wrong, and that's okay, I forgive you. And that maintains intimacy. And then the third thing that's happened with COVID is loss of control. For the first time, people can't control tomorrow. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. They, don't, they can't even know if their kids are in school. So those three things are opportunities. But grace, I'm sorry I was wrong, that's okay, I forgive you. And I find the non-Christian knows they can't cope without forgiveness. They're just not going to do it.
So um, C.S. Lewis, didn't he, said about being Christian, isn't this lovely? To be Christian is to forgive the indefensible in other people because God has forgiven the indefensible in you. It's lovely, isn't it? So, you know, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, when I understand the cross, I'm almost ready to forgive anyone anything. <laughs> you know, it's what we've been forgiven. So, as we look down, uh, let's go to the third one, glory. I've mentioned this before, but glory can we see is verse 25 of Romans 1. So we're on that first page still on motives. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Having done 20 years at All Souls on evangelism, when I, when I wrote this book, I realized it's idolatry that stops us doing it. So it's great you're here tonight. There are a lot of people who are not here who should be we've got to ask them questions about idolatry. <laughs> what are you living for? You know, what's the most important thing? And, um, and, 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 and so often, created things, not the creator, um, good things become our God. Um, f- things provided for our well-being. And what we want is the God we adore to be adored by others. So again, we've got to dig out the idols, and often that'll happen if, when you lose your temper. You know, when I lose my temper, what is it that I'm trying to get to? What's blocking my will? What's going on there? You know, just to have those questions. And physical health becomes more important than spiritual health. Physical appearance becomes more important than spiritual character. As you can see, it's not a problem for me. Um, uh, uh, Approval of people is more important than thankfulness to God. Status and wealth more important than identity in Christ. We've got to keep asking ourselves, what has captivated our little kingdoms? And, uh, and then fourthly, can we see as we look down, godliness. The fourth G there is godliness. And uh, do jot this down, I love this phrase. John Chapman said, you cannot be godly. You cannot be godly and not be concerned for the lost. God was so concerned for the lost, he sent his son to die. Now, at my church, All Souls, and I love my church family, there are a number of people who in their understanding, please write this down, of godliness, have separated holiness from evangelism. So they think they're being godly, but they wouldn't dream of doing evangelism. And the reason for that is, you might want to jot this phrase down, but this is what they say to themselves. I don't know if you've got friends that say this to themselves, but this is what they say to themselves. My faith is a personal private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of imposing it on anyone else. Isn't that right? My faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of imposing it on anyone else. So, so they, they, they just, you know, they're, and they're functional universalists. They never ask themselves the question, where will this person be in 100 years' time? Do you jot that down. Where will they be in 100 years' time? That's the question I've got to ask. Because success in life is what I do with Jesus. And, uh, and, 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 and therefore, we've got to do that. Now, what does that mean? Well, well, can you see here, what is it that makes God most angry? Have a look down, if you would, as we look down, verse 18. The wrath of God, God's anger, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who do what? They suppress the truth by their wickedness. So what makes God most angry is the truth about his son coming to rescue us is, is suppressed. And when we... As Christians also suppress it and say, I'm not talking about that, that'll make life inconvenient. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're right in the middle of, of, you know, what infuriates God. He sent his son to die and we don't bother telling people. Oh, brothers, sisters. Now, let me just um, get you to just in pairs now. Of those four, grace, Gehenna, glory, godliness, which one do you think you need to work on? So, we, you know, the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. Which one, which G, just as we come up to the events beginning of March... Which is the G that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, gosh, I need to get that back into my DNA. Have a couple of minutes just to chat about them. You know, which is your better, and maybe of them as well, which one do you go, actually, I'm not so bad at that one. I'm good at remembering that. I'm not so good at remembering that. Over to you. Just have a couple of minutes just chatting on the Gs, just getting them into our system before we move on. Okay, everyone, do take that away. Well, we're not long here tonight, so I want to go on. Just to say, I just want to make, do one advert now. Um, uh, this is not published by me, but I have found that with my church family, 
a major blockage to them speaking is this homophobic slur. You know, you're homophobic, what about gay people? You know, uh, don't Christians hate gay people? Well, I, I just want to say that this book, and I'd really commend it to you, produced by the Care Trust in Northern Ireland, has made a massive difference. I always carry it in my bag now. It's called X Out Loud, and these are 40 testimonies by people who've been in the transgender or in the gay lifestyle who've come to correct faith in Christ and who are now saying, in your churches, please be a safe place for me. I want you to be a home and you can be a home by affirming me in my celibate lifestyle. And this has really transformed, I think, the narratives going on. Um, uh, so um, there are transgender people, their stories here. There are gay people, their stories here. And they're saying, please, I need to come to a church where I'm not just affirmed, the non-Christian will, uh, 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 will, will tolerate me. I'm not just tolerated. I am celebrated. And that happens because you're under the authority of Jesus. The people who, when I got no platform, I can't tell you how many same-sex attracted celibate Christians got in touch and said to me, thank you, Rico, because I know eternity's at stake over this. But can I please recommend you have this book, and it's 40 testimonies of people saying, Please be a safe place for me. Now, I find the non-Christian, when I show them this, go, fair enough, Rico, that's fine. That's fine. You know, they are, the, the non-Christian in our culture is, is, is trained to look out for the minority, and this minority needs to feel safe in a church that is a home for them that affirms the Lordship of Christ. And that's a new narrative for us in the churches. So when you get someone who says, well, the churches are homophobic, you go, no. No, here are people who are same-sex attracted, and we're the only home they've got because we're the only people that affirm them in their following of Jesus. So, can I really recommend you get this? And if you've got people who, who, who make that slur against us, would you please show them this document and say, what about them? Where can they be safe? They don't feel safe, these people, in the wider culture. They've had the most brutal time in the world amid the sexual revolution, and they've come home to us... And we need to be a safe place affirming the Lordship of Christ. So that's very important in terms of where we're going. And it's a new narrative. X out loud, do get a copy, do carry it with you, do show it to people, it's huge for confidence. Right, as we continue to get confidence, let's turn please to the most important passage on evangelism in the Bible. So can you turn over the page to how? 2 Corinthians 4, 1-6. And again, this is a training sermon, brothers and sisters. So here's my question. In pairs, could you jot this down at the top of this, this verse here, these six verses? I want you to read it through. And here's my question. Who is at work in the work of evangelism? Okay, when we speak, who's at work? Okay, in pairs, just read through 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. And in pairs, dig that out. And then I'll pick a pair to tell me the answer. So I find that's very good. By the time it's quarter to nine, the risk of humiliation and failure is a good thing to motivate you. So someone's going to get chosen. So dig it out now because I'll be asking. Are we ready? 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Here's the question. Jot it down. Who's at work in the work of evangelism? What does the passage tell me? Great. Over to you. A couple of minutes. Read it through and dig it out. Who's at work in the work of evangelism? Okay. Got to keep going, I'm afraid. This is a great, you know, the second name we spoke about. I mean, I actually, I do it with non-Christians too, this passage. Always on the one-to-ones. Today I did it with a non-Christian, this passage. I'm um, with who I met at 2.30. We looked at this passage. Who's at work in the work of evangelism? He's coming to faith. It was a bit of a shock to him to see what was going on. But who's at work? Can we see as we look down, who does what? Can anyone just shout out, who does what in the work of evangelism? Give me a verse and tell me what's happening terms of our methodology. Very, yep, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Now, this is fascinating. Brothers and sisters, what happens if you do lose heart in verse 2? In verse 2, what happens if you lose heart? What do you start doing? You distort, distort the word of God. That is the Anglican Church. I'm a member of the Anglican Church. Why is it, why is it that, that Archbishop Welby has stopped speaking the truth? 
in terms of human sexuality. I know he believes it. Why is he not speaking it? It's because he's lost heart. He's looked at the culture. He says, we're never going to, to win this one. When actually, now, things are really changing. So, so um, you know, we've got stuff like this coming out. But, but Welby's lost heart, and so he's distorted the word of God. That's what you do. And there are two areas, by the way, do jot this down, that are the litmus test in terms of not distorting the word of God for a pastor and a preacher. Here are the two. Number one, wrath. God's settled, controlled hostility to evil. You've got to talk about hell. There's a place called hell. That's where we go if we go our own way. And secondly, repentance. Repentance is what will rip the Church of England apart, that word over the next 10 years. We are going to fall out over repentance because it's a, it's a primary issue. Okay, and repentance is lovely. Repentance means I'm for what Jesus is for and I'm against what he's against. So I just trust Jesus to lead me. And whatever Jesus says, if Jesus said, I mean, you know, my little six-year-old Mercy, you know, my, my daughter, you know, if Jesus, we trust Jesus. What does he say? We trust him. He died on the cross for us. He's Lord of all. So you distort the word of God if you lose heart. Brilliant, yeah. So I've got, to, I've got to keep having my quiet time and remembering the story I'm in. What else? Who else is at work in, in, the, in the work of evangelism? Give us another verse, brothers and sisters. Give us. Absolutely, yes. We proclaim it plainly. Now, as we look down, which verse articulates that proclamation? Absolutely right, we're to proclaim. Which verse says what we do, because I've, I've got to be clear on what I'm doing. Which verse? Verse 5. Do you see verse 5? So this is the job description. Are we ready? Verse 5. We preach Christ. That's our job. Our job is to speak about Jesus. Today when I met I said, you know, he asked me those four questions. I said, well, actually, the answer is Jesus to each of them in a different way. The word preach here is herald. It's not just a guy from the pulpit. We're all heralds of Jesus. So on Christianity Explored and Hope Explored, we have a talk from the front, and that's about Jesus. Then we meet in a small group and we discuss him in Luke's Gospel. Then we get the leaders to talk one-to-one. -one. Then people go home and read a bit of Luke. So the Gospel goes out from the front, small group, one-to-one -one and at home, but it's always preaching Jesus. And can you see who is the Jesus we preach in verse 5? We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus as... Right, so the trouble with, the, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury and I speak about a different Jesus. He speaks about Jesus and I do. But the Jesus I speak about is Lord, including of your bodies. And actually, what's interesting here is these people have said, and it's wonderful to come to Jesus as Lord. So, we, you know, he's Lord of all. So we've got to talk about the right Jesus. So we preach Christ. Who else is at work in the work of evangelism as we look down? God is at work. What does it say? Which verse? Verse 6. Now have a look, everyone. To jot this down. This is crucial to teach to this Christian person. And I'll tell you why. Write this word down, please, as, as I say it. Confidence. This word, this verse is crucial for confidence. And confidence is so much of what evangelism is about. So we're going to pathetically preach, preach Jesus. But do you see verse 6? For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Can anyone tell me where that's from in the Bible? Where does it say that there'd be light? Genesis 1. So the God who made the world in Genesis 1, jot it down, I know you know it, but jot it down to teach, made his light shine in our hearts. So he, he took the same power that made the world, he shone it into my heart, and he got me to believe to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, he got me to see, jot this down, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is God. That's what God does in evangelism. We preach Christ, verse 6, God opens blind eyes. So as you pathetically speak of Jesus, as in the beginning of March, you ask people along to events, you're saying, Lord, they've come, please open their blind eyes. Do the miracle. And how do we know they can do the miracle for us? How do, for, for God, for, how do we know we can do it for our friends? They did it for us. They did it for us. By the way, th what does this mean? This does mean that if you meet someone and you say, how come you're a Christian? And they go, oh, well, I just came from a Christian home. It's really boring. What do you have to do? You know what you have to do, don't you? You have to put your arm around them and gently, don't do it inside, take them to the car park and headbutt them. 
the reason you're Christian, even if you came to faith with a lovely godly mum when you were five, is God did a miracle and opened your blind eyes. Brother, sister, have you thanked God for that? It's a miracle that you're here tonight wanting to speak about Jesus, and it's because God has transformed you. And I know this is true because I've got members of my family, I mean, I think of my darling wife's, you know, people close to her, and they're stone-cold atheists. We need a miracle. And God's done it for my wife, but not for them. So this is, write this down, a miracle that God does. So have, are, you, well, you know, when we're, are you on your knees going, Lord God, thank you. I had my blind, when did you last do that? Go, Lord, the reason I'm Christian is you opened my eyes, you did a miracle, and, and conversion is a moment of recognition. I see who Jesus is. And so, this is the methodology for evangelism. Do we see? We preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. Great to teach to non-Christians, but to that Christian friend, have you got that? Let's just get it in place, everyone. Let's pretend we're a West Indian congregation now, okay? So can this side please say, we preach Christ? And can you respond, God opens blind eyes? Now, it may be that by this time in the evening, you're just feeling I'm slightly above it. Well, if that's the case, I promise you, if I see you're not saying it, you'll do it on your own. I'll get you to stand up, you'll do it on your own. I promise, then I'll go back to central London, okay? Are we ready? And we preach Christ. Pathetic. Good. And again, and. Still a little bit lacking in joy, brothers and sisters. Come on, we've got it's post COVID, we've got this opportunity. And again. Well done. Now, okay, next question for the passage. Jot it down because you're going to teach this to someone else. It's got to go through you as a river. Next question is how do we preach Christ? Back to you in groups. There are at least four applications on how we preach Christ in the passage. There are four things to remember as we do it. Over to you. Um, uh, give us, just give us four applications on how to preach Christ. Okay, just in pairs, just, just dig those out. Four applications. Two minutes. Okay, what have we got? Um, got to keep moving. This is a great, so first question, who's at work in the work of evangelism to do with that person we mentioned at the beginning? Second question, how do we preach Christ? Let's have a two or three applications on this. What verses tell me what I need to be doing as I speak of Jesus? Yes? Yes, that's right. As I speak of Jesus, I've got to have the confidence that'll be happening. So as I speak rather pathetically and say, do you know what I love about the person of Christ? I love the way. The first thing that struck me about him was that he taught, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and then he did it. He was a leader that he said, you know, love them even if they kill you. And then when he died, he said, love them. Uh, he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. You know, our problem with the leadership in this country at the moment is that Boris says one thing and he does another. But that's not a political point. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a little bit discouraging. But not Jesus. He said it and he did it. You know, that's what I love about I love being led by him. He was not a hypocrite. Um, what, what else have we got here? What else, what, what, what else have I got to remember? What, what does this tell me to do as we preach Christ? Sorry. I mean, don't lose heart. Yep, we've had that. And if we do, we've seen that. But, 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 but what might cause me to lose heart if I don't understand verse 6? What does verse 6 tell me about evangelism? When someone gets converted, who gets the credit? God, right. So it's nothing to do with the evangelist. If anyone becomes a Christian, it's nothing to do with the speaker. What's the speaker's job in verse 5? To preach Christ. But at the end of a mission, what do I always get asked? What's the one question I'm always asked at the end of a mission? How many were converted? Okay. And because I'm insecure, I'll say 820. <laughs> you see? And I might cut the price some more by. So I can tell you, um, and particularly before this document came out, I'm much more confident at, at, at talking about the, the human sexuality issue with this, saying we've got to be a safe place for these people. But actually, you know, it's hard to say the tough stuff sometimes. But, you know, just make sure your tone's right. But, you know, this way, what I've got to remember about, please jot this down, verse 6, the results belong to God. And if the results belong to me, if lots of people get converted, I'll be proud. And if not many are converted, I'll be discouraged. And either way, whether I'm proud or discouraged, I'll be a pain in the neck to all of you. So the results belong to God. I got a friend in Canada who got sacked 
for lack of results. As far as I could see, he was doing everything right. They, they sacked him. What else? What does verse 4 tell me in terms of what, what we've got here about the application? One is God, the results of God's. What is, if the God of this age, that's the devil, is blinding people, as we preach, what else must we do? Because we need a miracle. What else do we do? I've got to preach Christ. I've got to do something else. If the devil is, is blinding them and if I need a miracle, as, what else do I do apart from preach Christ? I've got to pray. Brothers and sisters, this is the call to pray. Now, can I tell you, if you see me up after 11 o'clock, you know that I've decided not to pray the next day. Okay, I'm just, that's just true in my life. I'll be annoyed if you say, oh, Rico, I just see you decided not to pray tomorrow, but it will be true. I just, what time I go to bed is, and if I don't say my prayers in the morning, they don't get said. We've got to start praying again. So, brother, sister, if you've stopped, start again and start with the person, the non-Christian, at the start of the evening. Each day we say, Lord, please, in March, make them hungry, Give me the courage to ask them. You know, help me to do that. And may they come. We've got to say our prayers. Absolutely key. So Satan laughs at a sermon that is not bound in prayer. I remember we had two sermons on postmodernism at the EMA, the Evangelical Ministers' Assembly, years ago. And uh, none of us knew what it meant. I think it's another word for sin. But anyway, um, uh, 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 at the end of it... Um, Eric Alexander stood up and he bawled out, after we'd had these sermons on the complexity of postmodernism, he bawled out the primary evangelistic method is prayer. The primary evangelistic method is prayer. We've got to pray. And please, can you pray for me? I'll say my prayers. Pray, I'll pray for who I saw today. Pray, I'll be praying for them. If you pray for them too, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so we preach Christ. God opens blind eyes. The results belong to God. We've, uh, we've got to say our prayers. We've got to tell the truth, wrath and repentance. And just as we look down here, just on sovereignty, which is God opens blind eyes, I just want to show you an incredibly exciting verse on sovereignty. Can you turn, please, to Acts 17, verse 24? So exciting. I'm, I've just been waiting to say this to you all evening. Hold on to your seats. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. And if you can turn to that, and if you can read verses 24, 25, 26, can you, as you read those verses, read it through, and with the person you're next to, see how God is described. How is God described in verse 24? How is he described in verse 25? How is he described in verse 26? Have we got Bibles? Have most people got them in pairs? Have we got them? Off we go. Have a look. You've got a minute, just a minute to read those verses through. Okay, everyone. How is God described in verse 24, everyone, of Acts 17? How is he described? The God who made the world and everything in it. He is the creator, is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. How is he described in verse 25? Yes. Uh, but, but, but what's the description of him? He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather... He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. What is he there? He's not just the creator. He is he's the sustainer. So God sustains everything, Colossians 1.15, in order that, Ephesians 1 verse 10, everything can be brought under Christ. So the whole world is being sustained to that end that it will be brought under Jesus. But God is the sustainer. So your neighbors are given each breath by Jesus. Each breath. How is God described in verse 26? From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So who is God there if he marks out where they live and how long they live? Who is he? He is the sovereign ruler. So God is the creator, do jot it down. He is the sustainer and the ruler. And therefore, the next question, of course, is what is his plan for the world? Verse 27, what's the creator sustainer's plan for the world? God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. God's plan for the world is evangelism. Now, we live in a culture that would laugh at that, but I mean, I read history at Bristol University. Can I tell you, I never did history because this is what history is about. People coming to know Jesus. You do know that, don't you? That's the story. The story of the world is people coming to know Jesus. 
And whilst, you know, we live in a culture that thinks it's slightly more dangerous and slightly less important than croquet. By the way, if you play croquet, welcome. It's lovely you do that. But, the, you know, it just, it's just seen as an irrelevance. It's not. So again, can I say, my neighbours who've just moved in, they think they've come to London to work for BP. They have not. Why have they come to London? To meet me. Now, poor neighbours. Now, once you believe that about your work colleagues, the person on the bus, about the next door neighbour, it transforms your confidence. Because every time you see them, it's a divine appointment. This morning when I came out of school, there was just there. And uh, I walked back uh, in a big circle with him because he's one of the people I'm praying for. And, and as we walked back, you know, that, you know we, we just walked along. But it was a divine appointment. God had put him there to meet me. And, you know, we chatted as we went along. It was interesting. He said to me, he said, I'd imagine with COVID, there's a lot of spiritual interest. It's quite a comment to make, isn't it? I'm going to keep praying. But it was God. God's the evangelist. Now, again, the key word here is confidence. Do you believe that about your neighbours and your office colleague? That the reason they're there is to come to Jesus. Now, of course, it's important they do a, that you do your job. But the big reason God's put them there is to meet you. Once you believe that, it transforms evangelism. So as you know, I'm heading back into London tonight on the train. I sit opposite someone. Why are they there? Why am I there? Well, this is the reason. God wants me to meet them. If you believe that, it's transformational. God is sovereign. So can we see as we look down? Sovereignty, God opens blind eyes. God plans it in history. Integrity, tell the truth. But thirdly, creativity, that is energy. Reach out for people. Now, if I may say, you know, this building's amazing. I mean, gosh, talk about creativity and energy to make it easier to reach people. But creativity is, what I'm meant to be is, we're meant to be, do you see as we look down verse, verse 5, ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. What does it mean to be someone's servant? servant? To be their servant, we need to be reaching out for them for Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 9 is the verse on that. And these three things are the three key planks of evangelism where Paul says, do you know this? To the weak I became weak, to the new weak I've become all things to all men, so by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. In other words, with his right hand rock solid on doctrine and belief, his left hand is reaching for people. What does it mean to reach people post-COVID? And that takes energy. So just write these three words down here. Uh, in, these are, everything you say on evangelism is about these three words. Sovereignty, which means you've got to pray. Please jot it down. Who's going to help you pray? Jot their name down. We've got to pray, God, please open Ben's blind eyes. Please, Lord, do the miracle. We've got to pray. Integrity, we've got to tell the truth. Who helps you tell the truth? You know, my wife, I've got to tell you about my wife, okay? She looks, she looks, like, she, she looks like butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. She looks at, she's just lovely and sweet. She hates false teaching and liberalism. It's wrecked people in her family. I get back from church and I've preached, and she says, um, how do you think it went? I said, well, I thought it was all right. She said, really? I didn't. I said, why is that, darling? She said, you didn't tell him the truth. You, you, you know, you, you, you bottled it, Rico. Darling, you bottled it. It's just brilliant because she just gets me clear on, on not lying to people, saying what's in it. Who have you got that, that will help you speak the truth? Can you jot their name down? Anne Nella. She's, she was a wonderful prayer at All Souls. She really helped me to pray. Again, my darling wife on telling the truth. You know, she just, you know, be faithful, Rico. And then thirdly, creativity. Actually, my ex-boss, Hugh Palmer, was great at saying, let's try this, let's try that. Let's read energy, energy, energy. What are we going to try? Let's just have a go. But those three things... And, you know, for you and your church, which one do you need? Do you need prayer? Do you need truth-telling? Do you need integrity? Do you need creativity? Great, everyone. We're just drawing to a close. We're just going to finish now. Um, and as we do that, I just want to um, turn you, please, to the second page, which is, which is this Word one-to-one -one material. Because and I'm just going to finish with this last five minutes. When it comes to those things, integrity, creativity, sovereignty, those three things, those, those, those key things, 
what, what does it mean to be doing those three things at the moment? Well, I think this is what sums it up a bit, if you can see as we close. This was evangelism in 1954-55 as Billy Graham came to Haringey. Here was God up here. Here's our sin. Here is, here's God here. And Billy preached the cross. So um, 2 million people went to Haringey. 40,000 were converted. Interestingly, of that 40,000, 90% were already in church. They were already part of the churches, and Billy said, repent and believe. 1994, when I arrived at All Souls, evangelism was more like this, if you can see. Here's, here, here are our friends over here, and there are great blocks in the way that stop them coming to Jesus. The culture has drifted from Christian faith. Christians are weird. And of course, sometimes they are. Sometimes you meet a Christian, you say, oh, my dear brother, you are weird. And of course, but they were weird before they were Christian, just to say, don't blame that on them being Christian. Um, it's irrelevant. It's just not real life. Um, it's untrue. Uh, it's homophobic. Again, that document is so helpful for that. And you have to gradually knock these over. You know, the reason I'm so thrilled about this document is it's really helping me knock over the homophobic bit because there is a gay community that's desperate to be in church and protected by us to be safe. But you have to knock these down, and then people eventually come to here, and they'll come on a course, say Christianity Explored, and come along. But now, 2022, where are people? Well, people are over here, and they're looking in that direction. So what is the key to evangelism? As I close, what is the silver bullet? What's the one thing we've got to be doing as we get the gospel out? Well, it's very simple. I mean, it's always been the case, but so much so now. The key to someone coming to faith is an individual who journeys with them. They've got to have someone who's their friend who's alongside them. You see, what used to happen is people would come along to All Souls, Hugh Palmer or someone would preach at a carol service, and because they had a Christian granny and they were low-hanging fruit, they would drop themselves into Christianity Explored, into a course. But now, oh dear, there we go, that was flexible. Okay, they come along to All Souls, they hear a carol service talk. I need someone to take their friend back to say, would you have a look at the Bible with me? And then they'll come on a course. So now there is an emphasis on the one-to-one -one journeying with people that there wasn't before. And we've all got to do it. And that's why, as we close, if you can see uh, this material here, John chapter 1. Do you, can you turn over pages 8 and 9 there that I've had photocopied for you? Which is, which is part of um, the word one-to-one. -one. I don't know if you've, you've come across it and you've seen it. Okay, it's this material here. But everyone at All Souls, we have 5,000 copies of these done, and everyone in the church family gets two of them. One for them and one for a friend. And all you have to do is be a holy page turner and just, you don't have to teach it, you just have to share it. And just go through John's Gospel. And we're training our church family just to go through it. And we say, we've all got Bibles, what are you going to do with them? But people aren't going to come straight to Christianity Explored. They need a friend to say, do you want to look at the Bible with me? And as we know, four in five will reject, but one or five will say, well, okay, I'm quite interested actually, post-COVID. And then you just go through. So do you see, I often get the non-Christian to read. You know, they'll read verses one to five, and then I get them to read the answers. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Are you there? Page nine. How often is the Word, the, the word used? John stresses twice the Word was there in the beginning. What or who is the Word? The Word was with God and was God. Verse two, the Word is the, the person. Verse three, oh, I love this bit. I love verse three. Do you see verse three? Through him, but hold on to your seats, the bomb's going off. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The word who is God and a person made everything. What do you think of that? That's enough for today, isn't it? He made everything. And as we preach Christ, what's God going to do as you say that? What's he going to do? Open blind eyes. So you just get, you just get, just get the Bible out and read it through. And the great thing about the word one-to-one -one is that it, you, just, you just be a holy page-turner. But this has been absolutely central to our efforts on evangelism because they, they, they aren't just going to come from the service to the course. They need someone 
who's going to journey with them. So will you do that? That person at the beginning we spoke about, are you ready to say, well, look, you know, actually you could just do these two pages to start. Just say, can I just ask you what you think of it? And sometimes, honestly, you get some guys that they just read it through, they don't say much, and you say, do you want to do the next book? And they go, yep. Do you want to do the next book? Yep. So that the, fourth, the third time I meet them, we read through, and then they go, uh, got a question. But just, just open the Bible, read the questions, read the answers, and let the word do it work, its work. And that, ladies and gentlemen, as I close, is the silver bullet for evangelism for the next 25 years in this country. That is the silver bullet. Whether we will get our Bibles open with non-Christians and read it with them. And the trouble is, for a lot of you, you weren't brought up with it. No one did it with you. But this generation, this, this lot, are further back. They need a friend they can trust to do it with. And so that's my challenge, to get the Bible out and just read it through. You don't have to know the answers. If they ask you a question you don't know, you said, I don't know, I'll come back next week. But just read it through. The questions and the answers, I think that's the silver bullet going forward. And I'd commend it to you. Let me close with a prayer. Let's close. Right, just, oh, brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, thanks for coming. Let's just stop now. And what's the one thing to remember from all that's been said? Just ask the Lord to help you clarify. What's the one thing to take away? Oh, Father God, as we go back to our churches and those two individuals we named at the start, we so pray, Father, that you would uh, enable the knowledge of the truth to lead to godliness. And we pray, Lord, most of all, for the glory and honour of Jesus. We, we thank you so much for him. Because of the miracle you've done, deep in our hearts, despite all the sin, we most want him honoured. And we pray out of this evening, he would be honoured. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to speak of him. We ask that you'd help us to pray, to look for opportunities and to say something. And Lord, we pray for that person who's the Christian friend. We pray we can say something to them. And the non-Christian, Lord, please open their eyes, draw them to yourself. And we pray all this for their sake and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Do, um, do come and take a phone um, uh, uh, clip of this book and, and get, get one yourself. It'll make a huge difference to your defending of the faith. Thanks. Rico, thank you so much um, for just being with uh, As I said at the beginning, it, it is such a sacrifice. But our prayer is that it would be a sacrifice of, of, of your gift to us for the sake of the gospel. Um, for all of us, can we, can we just, um, um, again, once more, just lift our hearts to God um, and pray, praise him for the gift of this evening, uh, for the gift that COVID restrictions um, have lifted so we can meet, for the gift that we have once more been focused on evangelism, for that gift, uh, Rico, that last, um, that last uh, picture there has just really opened my eyes to the, uh, the need of, of one-to-one sitting down. Uh, praise God that we've got a coffee shop to do that. Um, you know, is, isn't that wonderful uh, that, that God's given us uh, resources all over, the, all over the, the, not just here, but all over the, 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 the town um, for us to sit down with friends. And, and really the, the, the take home is, is let's, uh, let's equip ourselves from this evening. Um, let's, use, um, let's use events coming up. We've got baptisms uh, uh, here at Oak Hall Church on, on Sunday night. You know, if you're, ac- if you're at all curious um, or, or if you've been struck by anything that Rico said, uh, then do just come and hear the testimonies of people who have become Christians in the last year. Uh, grown-ups, uh, uh, slightly older, slightly younger, but just the joy of people saying, I was once lost, but now am found. If there's one thing that will inspire your heart, it is someone telling you about how they, their, their eyes were opened by the living Lord Jesus. Use them. Use these resources. Um, as we said at the beginning of, of March, we've got um, from the 28th of February to the 6th of March, we've got a More to Life week being hosted by the Baptist Church, Sanders Dead Evangelical Church, um, and ourselves here. More on the website, website to follow, but use them. 
pray for your friends, bring your friends along, um, take them away and sit them at a coffee shop, open the Bible with them. Uh, we've got the word one-to-one here, here at the church. Order it from 10ofthose.com. That will be recorded and shown live so you can remember that. Look, there are so much. Uh, uh, my prayer is that this would be the beginning of a, a fire in our hearts that says, I want my friends to know about Jesus. That's my big prayer. And I pray that it would be all of our prayers. Even if we're sat here going, well, that's just no, not where I am, then I, I think Dan said it once. Well, let's pray that we want to pray that. Or, or, or pray that we want to want to pray it, etc., etc. Just keep going. Um, and uh, may we be used, um, as Rico has been used this evening. Uh, let's praise God. Uh, for all uh, that is to come um, through his word, through opening blind, eye, blind eyes, uh, through using you and I, his church, um, to share this great gospel um, that, we've, that, that we've been given. Um, and, and I pray that we would be uh, just fired up this evening um, and that it would be a, a glorious beginning um, to seeing our friends come to know Jesus. Uh, let me pray, shall I, just one, one more time. Lord God, we, we praise you and worship you uh, just for all that you have uh, shared with us this evening. Um, Lord, may this settle in our hearts. May we be inspired to pray, challenged to pray. May we be challenged to share, to cross that pain barrier. Lord God, may we be cha challenged to use the resources at hand um, to, to read the Bible one-to-one. -one with our friends, Lord God, and may we unashamedly um, just keep asking those questions and keep asking those questions, that you would use us and grow the gospel in us and through us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, Rico, thank you ever so much for coming. <clears throat>